Welcome to the Bible Answers. Man has long wanted to know what happens after he dies. Generally, he hopes he'll be much happier than he is now. The American Indian, for example, expected to go to a happy hunting ground. Wealthy Egyptians were buried with their possessions so they'd feel at home in their new world. Christians have the same prospect. They expect, when they die, to enter a condition much better than the life they now have, a condition called heaven. But what about non-Christians? For them, it's a different story. Some say the non-believer will be tortured everlastingly in literal flames of hellfire from which there will never be a relief. Can that possibly be true? Let's see what the Bible has to say. Let's begin by examining the original Hebrew and Greek words that are used in the Bible for the word hell. In the Old Testament, there is only one Hebrew word translated hell, and it is the Hebrew word sheol. In Professor Young's exhaustive concordance to the Bible, we find that the word hell in the King James Bible is the Hebrew word sheol. If you look it up, for every time that the word sheol is used, you would find that everyone who has ever lived goes into sheol at death, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. But this fact is hidden in our King James translation. As Professor Young's lexicon shows, Sheol is translated three different ways. Grave, 31 times. Hell, 31 times. And pit, three times. The important point is that every time a good person died, then the King James translation says he went into the grave. But if it was a bad person who died, the translators supplied the word hell. The reader of this translation is thus left with the impression that there are two different places that one may go at death. There's one place for the good, there's a different place for the bad. But in the original Hebrew, that's not true. Everyone, the good and the bad, go into the same condition at death, the condition the Old Testament calls Sheol. Consider the patriarch Jacob, the father of the nation of Israel. He sent his favorite son Joseph to see the other sons who were tending the flocks. Joseph's brothers, in their jealousy, seized him and sold him into slavery. Then they told a story that made Jacob believe that Joseph had been killed by wild animals. He was so grief-stricken that he said, I will go down into the grave, it's Sheol, unto my son mourning. Jacob not only expected to go to Sheol, he was sure his beloved son was already there because he thought he was dead. Let's look at another example. Job, a, a holy prophet of God, was suffering so much that he literally prayed to go to Sheol. And this is what he said. Oh, that thou wouldst hide me in the grave, the Hebrew is Sheol, all the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Thou wilt call, and I will answer thee. Was Job praying to go to a hell of torment? Certainly not. Job was praying that he might die and go to sleep in Sheol and be taken out of his pain. He knew he would be at rest, unconscious, until the time when God would call him back to life in the kingdom. Let's look at a few scriptures that confirm that Sheol merely means the condition of death, unconsciousness, sleep. It's the condition that everyone experiences, whether good or evil, whether Christian, heathen, Jew, Muslim, or atheist, all await the resurrection that Job anticipated. Psalm 146 speaks of man's death. It says, His breath goeth forth. He returns to his earth. In that very day, 
his thoughts perish. Well, if one's thoughts have perished, they are unconscious. They're asleep. Now, this is the New American Standard translation of a text in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Now, in this translation, the Hebrew word sheol is left untranslated. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol, whither thou goest. This is a perfect description of unconscious sleep. It is the condition to which we are all going as it ends with the words, whither thou goest. And thus we can see from our brief look at a few scriptures that none of the misunderstanding about hell would have occurred if the translators had consistently rendered the Hebrew sheol with the English word grave. Let's look at one final scripture in the Old Testament. It shows that sheol is not a hell of everlasting torment. In fact, hell will be destroyed. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, I will be thy plagues. O oh, sheol, I will be thy destruction. This is a prophecy of how Christ's death would redeem all mankind. As a result, everyone will be resurrected from Sheol, the grave. Eventually, the condition of death itself will be destroyed. So instead of the word hell, with its unfortunate imagery of fire and brimstone, we should substitute the word grave when we read the Old Testament. Before we turn our attention to the New Testament, we'd like to mention that at the end of this program, we'll be offering a free booklet entitled, The Truth About Hell. Here, you will be able to examine for yourself every single scripture in which the Hebrew word Sheol appears in the Old Testament. As you do, you will see that Sheol simply means the grave, unconscious sleep, which everyone goes into. The booklet also includes every New Testament reference to hell. So now, let's look at the New Testament. These books were originally written in Greek. In the book of Acts, we read a text of Scripture that the Apostle Peter applied to our Lord Jesus. Most people don't think that Jesus went to hell when he died, but this Scripture says he did. Peter is speaking. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Peter is quoting from Psalm 16. The Hebrew word that's translated hell in that psalm is Sheol. So in the New Testament, we know the Greek word used in Acts, which is the Greek word Hades, is an exact equivalent to the Hebrew word Sheol, which literally means the condition of unconscious death. The New Testament contains two other Greek words that are also translated hell. Hades is equivalent to Sheol, but the Greek words Gehenna and Tartaru are different. First, let's consider Tartaru, because that Greek word appears only once in the Bible. We read in 2 Peter, God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, that's Tartaru in the Greek, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. This is probably the scripture that makes people think that hell is populated with fallen angels, but they were not cast down to hell, but to Tartaru. The Tartaru condition refers to the imprisonment of the fallen angels in chains of darkness with their liberties restrained. The only other Greek word translated hell in the New Testament is Gehenna. Scriptures containing the Greek word Gehenna do speak of fire and brimstone. Here's an example from the Gospel of Mark. If thy hand offend thee, Cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, Gehenna, 
into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Jesus' audience recognized that his reference to the cutting of a hand was not to be taken literally, but was a figure of speech. Certainly, there's not a single recorded instance in the Bible where any of Jesus' disciples did this. His listeners knew all about Gehenna because it was a real place. The Greek word Gehenna is a transliteration of the Hebrew word Gehinnom, which means Valley of Hinnom. In Jesus' day, this valley was the garbage dump of the city. Refuse from the city, the carcasses of animals, executed criminals, were thrown into it to be totally consumed. What the ever-burning flames failed to consume, the worms ate. When the people in Jesus' audience heard the word Gehenna, they knew it meant complete destruction. And that's exactly what Jesus meant. But the question might be asked, just what is the distinction between Hades and Gehenna? The word Hades, or the equivalent word Sheol, is likened by the Bible to a sleep. Jesus said his friend Lazarus sleepeth. When the disciples misunderstood, Jesus said plainly Lazarus was dead. Jesus awakened Lazarus and others from the sleep of death to show the power of his heavenly Father. What could be done with one person was clearly possible with any number, even billions. The Hebrew Sheol and the Greek Hades represent the sleep of death from which everyone will be awakened in Christ's kingdom. Gehenna, on the other hand, is quite different. The Greek word Gehenna is used as a symbol of complete destruction without the possibility of a resurrection. It is exactly the same concept as lake of fire as found in Revelation. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The expression lake of fire can be found only in the book of Revelation. Many who picture hell as a place of eternal flames think the devil is in the middle of the lake of fire and has been since he appeared at the beginning of the Bible. But that's not what this scripture says. The devil is not cast into the lake of fire until the end of the kingdom. Being cast into the lake of fire refers to Satan's complete destruction. The beast and the false prophet are also in the lake of fire, and they represent false systems that were previously destroyed. The lake of fire is exactly like Gehenna. It's a symbol of complete destruction. We can be sure about that because of what the Apostle Paul has written about Satan. Here are words from his letter to the Romans. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. That's how the King James translators have rendered the original Greek into English. But the original Greek does not say bruise. The word means crush. And that's the way most newer Bibles translate this word. Crush means destroy. And in Revelation, this destruction is shown by the symbol lake of fire. Of course, Revelation also says that after being cast into the lake of fire, the devil will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The phrase that's translated tormented day and night forever and ever is another way of saying everlasting punishment, which literally means everlasting destruction. For remember, the Apostle Paul says plainly, the devil will be crushed. This same thought, is conveyed by Jesus in Matthew chapter 25 in what is called the parable of the sheep and the goats. The goats on his left hand hear these words, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. In verse 46, 
they shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. In this parable, the sheep are not literal, the goats are not literal, and the fire is not literal. The goats referred to are those who, after being resurrected in God's kingdom, will absolutely refuse to obey. And as a result, they'll die a second time in what the scriptures refer to as the second death. That's a death from which there is no resurrection. Their everlasting punishment will be everlasting destruction, just like the devil and his angels. There's another parable we should consider. It's called the rich man and Lazarus, and it's found in Luke 16. Jesus talks about a poor man named Lazarus who wanted to eat just the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. But he got nothing. He died and he went to Abraham's bosom. Then the rich man died and he went to hell. The Greek word is Hades. There he cried to be relieved of his torment. He talked with Abraham. He was told that no one could change his condition. That's what these verses actually say, and there's very little argument about that. But what does it mean? Some have said this is not a parable. It is a plain statement of fact. Let's think about that. Only a few of the parables are explicitly said to be parables. Only one of the four parables that precede this one is actually called a parable by Jesus. And then comes the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Think about it. What did Lazarus do that entitled him to such a great reward after he died? All we know for sure is that he was poor. Does this teach us that all poor people go to Abraham's bosom when they die? And what did the rich man do that deserves such terrible treatment after he died. All we really know for sure is that he was rich. Does this teach us that all rich people are tormented everlastingly in hell when they die? Surely not. The Greek word Hades is the Greek word translated hell in this parable, and it means the place or the condition of the dead. It's the exact equivalent of the Hebrew word sheol, a word that never meant that someone was conscious after death. If a literal rich man is in literal Hades, the place of the dead, he could not be conscious of anything, but, but stories and parables are something else. The rich man and Lazarus is a story, a parable. It's given to make a point. Let's consider what that point really is. Parables are not actual events. There was no literal shepherd who had a hundred sheep, nor a literal man who had one spendthrift son and one apparently loyal son, nor a steward who made friends of his master's debtors. These were stories to illustrate a larger truth, and no literal rich man went to hell where he held a conversation with Abraham. This rich man pictures the nation of Israel, as a nation, and prior to the coming of Jesus, their Messiah, they were considered rich because they alone received God's promises. The Gentile nations were pictured by the beggar Lazarus because they were in a state of alienation from God. Both groups died in the sense that their condition changed dramatically. The state of the Gentiles changed when the gospel was brought to them. Believing Gentiles were carried into Abraham's bosom, where they became children of Abraham through faith and thus inherited the promises God originally made to him. The state of Israel changed radically when as a nation they were cast out of God's favor because they rejected their Messiah. Ever since that time, they have been tormented in the sense that Jews have suffered continuous persecution. Asking for a drop of water is a picture of the appeals for mercy and assistance that have been made by Israel to the favored Gentiles. This interpretation concurs 
with the history of the past 2,000 years. When properly understood, the Bible does not teach the concept of a burning hell. Yet a great many Christians have been taught that God will eternally torture disobedient sinners and non-believers without any possibility of relief. Our society is so conscience-stricken at human rights abuse that we find such a thought abhorrent. How could people ever have gotten such an idea? Let's ask a related question. How could God's special people, the Israelites, ever think it was acceptable to offer their children in sacrificial flames to the heathen god Baal? It was not the God of heaven who told them to do this. It was the devil. The devil supports anything that brings discredit to God. If people think God is vindictive and even more harsh than they are, many will turn away from him, just what Satan would desire. Unfortunately, church leaders many years ago liked the doctrine of eternal torment because it suited their purposes. They reasoned that it was better to keep people in the church through the fear of hell than to not keep them in church at all. We're almost out of time. If anyone thinks God intends to torture people in flames of fire forever and ever, think about what God himself says when he condemned Israel for doing this very thing. Let's read from Jeremiah. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire meaning they cast them alive into fire as a sacrifice, unto Moloch, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination. For many centuries, people have feared the fires of hell and gone to church because of that fear. Today, many modern theologians would have us believe that hell means separation from God. Perhaps it's time for those who want to know what the Bible really says to check the meaning of the original Hebrew and Greek words. The Bible, hell, does not mean separation from God or eternal torment. It means death, the grave in which all sleep awaiting the resurrection. The confusion about the Bible, hell, can be traced right back to the Garden of Eden. In Genesis, we read about what God said and what Satan said would happen if our first parents were to disobey God's commandment. This is what the serpent says. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Of course, this was a lie. Adam and Eve saw that it was a lie when their son Cain killed their son Abel. Abel was really dead. But eventually, religions began suggesting that people don't really die when they stop breathing. They say they really go on living in some unseen world. Throughout the ages, Satan has convinced nearly everyone that death is only a transition into another world. But that is not what God said. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. If it were not for God's great love in providing a Savior, mankind would have died without the possibility of being resurrected from the dead. But because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Bible promises that everyone will be brought back to life here on the earth. When the Apostle Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians, he said, As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Most people believe God is a God of love. He is. 
Do you really think he would torture people forever and ever in a literal burning hell because during their brief lifetime they didn't do what he wanted them to do? You and I would not do such a thing to our worst enemies, and neither will he. Now is the time when his creation is having direct experience with sin and evil. And in a coming kingdom, everyone will have direct experience with righteousness. But that's something we're going to save for a future program. If you would like more information about what the Bible really says about hell, we suggest that you write for our free booklet, The Truth About Hell. As you look at this booklet, you'll find many interesting things in it. Chapter 1, for example, discusses the wages of sin. And quoting from Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Notice, not eternal torment. Chapter 2 looks at the Hebrew word sheol as it discusses hell in the Old Testament. Chapter 3 looks at the Greek word Hades as it discusses hell in the New Testament. And the final chapter, chapter 4, looks at Gehenna and unquenchable fire. In fact, this booklet examines every scripture in the Bible containing the word hell, including every reference to Sheol, Hades, and Gehenna. After reading and seeing the harmony of all these scriptures, we feel confident that your faith in a loving and benevolent Creator will be even stronger. In a future program, we'll talk about what will happen to all those who have died and are asleep in the death condition of Sheol, Hades. We hope you can join us again. And now, may the Lord bless you in your study of His wonderful words as recorded for us in the scriptures. To view the booklet online, visit www.dawnbible.com or to receive a hard copy of the booklet by mail, send an email to dawnbiblerequest at gmail.com. Include your name and postal mailing address and ask for the booklet by name. The name of the booklet for this program is The Truth About Hell. The booklet will be mailed to you free and without obligation. And now, goodbye, and may God bless you.